Good afternoon, everyone. Um, to those of you joining here from Washington, D.C. or uh, in Western Europe and points in between, and good evening to those of you coming from Turkey and points nearby. My name is uh, Soner Çabdai. I'm a Bayer Family Fellow and Director of Turkish Research Program at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. I'd like to welcome you today's uh, policy forum discussion virtually held at the Washington Institute on Turkey's presidential runoff on May 28th. This is a discussion that we have put together and framed to look at likely the outcome of the runoff uh, presidential race and what to expect afterwards regarding Turkey's domestic politics, its foreign policy, and of course, quite importantly, its ties with the European Union and the United States. For that, I've uh, invited a number of uh, good colleagues, uh, good friends and colleagues who have joined me today. I'll introduce them to you in a second. Uh, but joining me is uh, in the room, Elçin Poyrazlar, uh, Emre Peker, and Humeyra Pamuk. Um, the elections in Turkey on May 14th uh, uh, resulted with President Erdogan's bloc uh, leading in the presidential race uh, at 49.5%, outperforming expectations at perhaps some polls. Uh, though at the same time, President Erdogan's bloc also uh, won legislative majority. Uh, his uh, challenger, opposition presidential candidate Kemal Kılıçdaroğlu, led behind at just around 45% of the popular vote. And because neither candidate got 50% required by the constitution, uh, the race goes to a runoff on Sunday between the two top vote getters. And so on Sunday, we'll know who Turkey's uh, next president is. Uh, today's discussion will focus on that outcome, but also its short and mid and long-term implications uh, for the country's democracy, its uh, foreign policy environment. For that, uh, I'm joined today and uh, grateful that they're here with me by three colleagues. I could not think of better analysts uh, to come into the room. I'll introduce you, uh, my uh, colleagues first, and then we'll go around for a round of comments. If you have registered to this event online, uh, which means you're streaming this, uh, you're welcome to use the chat box to type in your questions. If you are viewing this on YouTube, uh, you can uh, anytime email questions to policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org, and I'll try to answer as many of them as possible. We have hundreds of people watching us on our streaming website and perhaps thousands, if not tens of thousands on YouTube. Really excited to see a big turnout. Uh, you're welcome to uh, take notes from today's event. Uh, use it in your analysis and reporting. Uh, use it on social media and tweet it, of course. So without further ado, uh, I wanna uh, in, uh, introduce my colleagues, starting with Elçin Poyrazlar. Elçin is a uh, columnist for Turkey's uh, Daily Cumhuriyet, which is the oldest newspaper in the country, of course. Uh, she has spent over two decades covering Turkey for various publications, including uh, over a productive stint here in Washington uh, when we met. Uh, and she has most recently covered the elections for Politico. Uh, tremendous coverage. She was on the ground, on the field. Um, and Elçin also is a uh, novelist, uh, publishes uh, bestseller thriller. So if you don't know her work, I would recommend go and get her some of her books. But today, uh, of course, she'll provide us, starting with Elchin, therefore, insight uh, on the elections and on the runoff and the campaign season. Uh, Elchin, uh, uh, before I go to my colleagues, just want to say hi to you and thank you again for joining us today. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be um, with you and all this, uh, all the, you know, familiar colleagues of mine, my friends. Um, Just well, give me one second. I, I want to yeah. actually introduce the other two colleagues also, and I'll come back to you. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, moving on, Emre Peker is joining from London. He's the uh, Europe Director at Eurasia Group. Previously, Emre covered Turkey and NATO issues at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, he is also a member of a Pulitzer-nominated team covering Turkey's failed 2016 coup attempt. Uh, Emre has amazing takes on Turkey and uh, Turkish politics. Uh, if you're not subscribed to his a news and bulletin at Eurasia Group. I'd recommend to do so and also definitely follow on Twitter. Emre, good to see you as well and uh, thank you for joining us. We're moving on now to a uh, last uh, panelist joining uh, me here in Washington. That's Tumeira Pamuk. She's a senior foreign policy correspondent for Reuters covering the State Department. Tumeira has spent about two decades for Reuters, uh, provided coverage from nearly 50 countries. I think she has traveled more than I have. Uh, as well as having been posted in UAE, um, Egypt, and UK, and most recently, of course, in uh, Washington. Kamara has always the best scoops. And once again, of course, if you're not a uh, follower on Twitter, please do so. So what we'll do next is uh, go back uh, to the speaking order of the speakers. I'll ask each of my colleagues to make uh, some brief comments. 
Uh, I'll take my hat off as a moderator, introduce my own comments at the end, and then we'll go into Q&A. As I said, if you are registered uh, and got a link, then you can access the chat box, uh, type your questions in there. And if not, you can always email us questions at policyforum at washingtoninstitute.org. Actually, I want to turn to you first. You were in Turkey uh, during the campaign season before uh, May 14th and also spent some time afterwards. I was an avid consumer of your coverage from the field. You went to uh, southern Turkey, earthquake-stricken provinces. You went to different provinces to get a, a pulse of the campaigns. And you also spent some time in the runoff era. So uh, maybe I can start by asking you what your take is. Uh, what should we expect on May 28th? Um, evaluate a little bit strategies of the opposition block uh, and President Erdogan's block in the runoff, especially. Sure. And also talk about the implications of this uh, outcome for democracy and, and uh, women's rights and human rights in Turkey. Yeah, that these are a lot of questions. <laughs> but um, yeah, I went to Turkey. I have been covering this um, election, run up to election since February. Um, I went immediately after the earthquake because I thought this is going to be the biggest theme, main theme of the elections in Turkey that could change all the dynamics. And when I went on the ground, I saw that, it, it, to my surprise, that was not the case. So um, I first went to Istanbul and, you know, I wanted to see uh, as a microcosm of Turkey, which, because Istanbul is basically you can say multicultural, and then it's a small representative of the country, and to big AKP bastions, you know, neighborhoods, you know, big CHP bastions, and the swing voters, and the first voters, which is Gen Z, and um, how they would react. And to my surprise, I found that the bases were very much consolidated, and the AKP government, especially Erdogan, was not held responsible for the earthquake disaster or even the inadequacy in the relief process. And, uh, and then secondly, I went to Ankara to talk to you know, insiders, politicians, both camps, or you know, HDP as well, which is a you know, pro-Kurdish um, uh, party. And uh, to my surprise again, I saw that AKP camp was very confident that they will get the elections but that there was a demand of change. There was a wave uh, of this desire for change in the country, although it didn't really uh, come to concrete results that I felt. So that's why in my, you know, in, uh, in my political coverage, we said 50-50. These were the, just before, after the earthquake and before May, um, you know, craze, frenzy time before the elections. So it's true, opposition on the 14th of May did quite well. But Erdogan didn't lose that much support that we thought, or the outsiders, or the oldest strategic analysts thought he would lose. And that's the Erdogan's factor. You know, he's a, he has a, person, a personality cult. He's, um, you know, his base is very loyal to him. And I saw this even in, you know, women, younger women or older women. And um, some of the uh, badly affected, you know, SNAF, which we say like the shopkeepers as, as well. So the oldest people um, that I talked to, I talked to, I don't know, dozens of them. They feel that there is something wrong with the economy. They feel that there is something wrong with the management of the country. There is something wrong with the relief of earthquake. You know, there is, there is suffering. They admit that. But then they go back and say, the only person who can really save us from this and who can help us uh, build a better uh, country is Erdogan again. So... Well, after watching all this time and then, you know, going back and forth, covering this, and then the first round came and there was a huge hype for the opposition, you know, that there's going to be a spring, there's going to be democracy, we will go to a parliamentary system and everything's going to be, you know, old in old ways, like old Turkey uh, dream. But then we saw there was a warning to Erdogan with this result, 49% five, because that was the first time he couldn't really get over 50%. And his party, 
was uh, as low as the first time in 2002, uh, 35%, because he, he, they came to power in 34% in 2002. So I saw it, I read it as a warning to Erdogan, but not necessarily completely convinced by Kılıçdaroğlu-led uh, opposition team, which is very diverse and we can talk about it later on. And I also realized in the field that this is a very, very existential um, election for both camps. And it's a very polarized country. You know, camps are very strictly divided. On the one hand, there's, you know, the let's say the opposition camp is saying this is unsustainable. We can't go on like this because there is no democracy. It's going to be completely autocratic country. We might lose our rights, women's rights. And everything is at stake, like, you know, also the Kurdish issue is still a, you know, a burning point. But on the other hand, uh, there is this group of people, which is almost 50% supporting Erdogan. They are saying, okay, the country is not that bad, because if the others come, we would be in bad shape again, like we were 20 years ago, economically, socially, and in terms of the status they have right now. So I saw that as a basically a referendum about the regime in Turkey, a refer referendum about the two camps, who wants what and who is more organized and how they can go further. And now we are at the second round uh, of the elections. Um, and it looks like if there is not a you know, last minute miraculous situation, because this is Turkey we are talking about, 24 hours is a long time for Turkish politics. It looks like, uh, unfortunately, um, for the opposition um, supporters, it is going to be a win for the status quo, which is Erdogan. But then again, we shouldn't ignore the fact that the opposition did very well. This was the very first time in 20 years uh, of Erdogan's rule. They were very organized. They could uh, ride the wave of uh, desire for change a bit. Maybe they didn't deliver as much, but politics is a long game. It's a marathon. And Erdogan is a shrewd politician. He had many, many uh, advantages, uh, like the judiciary, like the 90% of the media control, like the financial um, you know, sources, resources from the state. And um, and then a very polarized culture. And I saw on the ground one thing, which I, I'd like to say that when I was talking to AKP supporters, it was basically word uh, by word what Erdogan was telling them. They were telling, we are never going to vote for the opposition because that means uh, the PKK, the terror groups will come to power. We are never going to vote for the opposition because they can't manage this economy. We are in crisis. We are suffering, we are hurting, yes, but the others won't do this, won't be able to do this. So uh, it was. It, it is a super interesting uh, election. I think it is one of the, maybe the most important election this year in the world, because it's not only going to affect what Turkey would become in the next, next five years, but how would it affect uh, Europe? How would this affect Ukraine-Russia war? How would this affect the relations with the US? Uh, how would this affect whole regional uh, developments? So uh, as a citizen, as a Turkish citizen, I find this, um, you know, nerve breaking because every minute, you know, you are waking up to something else every day. Uh, but as, a, as, a, as an expert, I just is fascinating. I found this fascinating. And even though the results um, because there were a lot of talks about everybody was thinking that was the other thing I'd like to mention on the ground, whether AKP supporters or the opposition supporters, everybody was saying 90% these elections will be rigged. And it depends what percentage it will be stolen. But when we look at the um, first round of elections, uh, there were some irregularities, yes, and there were some uh, accusations, yes, but uh, nobody could bring up a complete, you know, as a concrete um, stolen, proven that these elections were stolen. And uh, so 
it is really up to now the opposition candidate, Kılıçdaroğlu, to run this wave, but it looks like he has um, returned to a completely different kind of campaign, uh, electoral campaign in the last two weeks, a very anti-refugee campaign, because before that he was more positive, he was more um, inclusive, he was talking about, you know, he was mostly showing his soft power and many people were attracted to that. Uh, and this brought some kind of hope uh, to, to the um, uh, opposition supporters, you know, base. But now it's the rhetoric is very hard. It it's almost resonates like this is Erdogan speaking in some ways and, you know, that he would like to send all of the refugees back home as soon as he comes back. And the fact that he's he had done a deal with a ultra nationalist that you know scares some parts. Also, the HDP. Although I saw today that they are still going to uh, support Kılıçdaroğlu's candidacy, and um, but after the elections, it looks like there is going to be a lot of um, political fights. Waiting. Okay. Uh, this is great. If you can maybe wrap up in about a minute or so, and we'll come back to some of these points in the Q and A. I, I'm done basically. I mean, this is fascinating, but you know, um, is this as exciting as you know, unpredictable as the first round? I don't think so. We know more or less what's going to happen. All right. Thank you so much. I will definitely come back to uh, some of your points in the Q and A. But I think a takeaway is that uh, the electorate want to change but it's not convinced that Kalishtarolu can deliver that. And so somehow still sticking to uh, Erdogan. Uh, I think that I would actually agree with you because I saw some polls uh, just before the first round that showed Kalishtarolu winning, but when asked who they thought would win, the electorate was picking uh, Erdogan. So with that, I wanna turn to Emre. Emre, if you can tell us what your take is uh, uh, for Sunday's votes and then look at the outlook or provide an outlook for us, uh, Turkey, especially the economy, uh, given that uh, it's reported that the central bank uh, is burning Turkey's reserves to keep the lira stable. Is the economic outlook stable, sustainable? And then also end with, uh, since you focus on this at Eurasia Group, uh, you know, Turkey's perspective, your perspective on Turkey's ties with the EU going forward. Happily, uh, Sonar, and thank you for having me on the panel again. Uh, Elchin is a tough act to follow, but I'll do my best. Um, I think I'd like to pivot off some of her comments, actually, uh, with, with regards to my outlook for Sunday. Uh, like Elchin, I, I also anticipate I'd want to uh, finish first and clinch re-election uh, on the 20th of May. Uh, I think one thing that we can say with a lot of certainty, uh, having seen especially the results of the first round uh, and how uh, the public opinion polls missed, uh, especially in the final 10 days or so leading up to the elections, uh, where sentiment, voter sentiment was headed, uh, we can say that identity politics dominated the campaign despite the deepest economic problems in Turkey since the 2001 financial crisis. I mean, this is huge and you can't underscore it enough, I don't think. Uh, and th this sort of throws out the window all political assumptions uh, dating back to Demiral and all prior leaders saying that if you know the whole, it's the economy stupid argument no longer holds for Turkey or the situation needs to get a lot more severe before uh, voters make that move. So I think that's an important takeaway. Um, I agree with Achin that the opposition did well in consolidating the bloc and its votes, but I, I think where it failed uh, under Kulsarol's leadership was expanding its share of the overall pie. Uh, I think 45 is a natural ceiling considering the candidate and considering the alliances that the Kulsarol candidacy was built on. Uh, and, uh, uh, and and I agree with Elchin that that was a huge successful project uh, by Mike Kalisarolo and the CHP. But the 
challenge lies in getting a bigger slice of Turkey's majority conservative and right of center voters, which make up anywhere between 60 to 65 percent of the electorate. And that's the segment where Erdogan dominates and has become such a huge figure. And we've seen him successfully use this debate about terrorism, which should have been for all practical purposes, a non-issue in this election to overshadow economic concerns and move the debate away from primary voter concerns to secondary issues like traditional family values by banging on about LGBTI rights and same-sex marriage, uh, by banging on about terrorism, national security, Turkey's role and place in the world, to an area where Kılıçdaroğlu is not perceived to be as strong. And on the back of the first round, with the uh, sort of more hawkish uh, rhetorical turn in the Kılıçdaroğlu campaign that Ercan alluded to, uh, we're, we're seeing essentially the opposition candidate getting pulled firmly onto terrain where Erdogan has led for two solid decades, where he's very comfortable, and when he knows that we, even with his hand tied behind his back, he can beat his opponent. Um, and this is a big loss, I think, for the opposition, and also contribute, contributes to Turkey's political polarization. So given all these dynamics and, and the outcome of the first election, I expect uh, that what we're seeing in the current opinion surveys uh, that are being published that show a uh, win for Erdogan with 52 to 54% of the votes to largely hold and, uh, and Erdogan to go in uh, to secure a third term as president. Um, as you highlight, the economy will be his number one problem uh, as he kicks off the new term. Uh, the current economic policies are uh, unsustainable, uh, but a, a, an Erdogan uh, vindicated by re-election, despite uh, the highest inflation we've seen in years, uh, despite significant pressures on the lira, uh, despite uh, uh, high unemployment and and people's concerns, uh, winning re-election will feel quite vindicated and say, "Hey, you know, I won, so I'm sticking with this." Moreover, uh, I think. Uh, he's politically committed to his model, and other than bashing the so-called interest rate lobby and opposing on principle high interest rates, I think the president is also motivated by a desire to wean Turkey off its overall economic dependence on Western partners. Uh, that's, I think, an unrealistic goal. But uh, uh, since the 2018 elections, the government has constantly work towards decoupling from Western financial markets to the largest extent that it can to deter uh, portfolio inflows, so-called hot money. Uh, it hasn't gotten as much FDI as it used to from its traditional Western commercial partners. Instead, uh, the economy has relied on financing from Russia, investments from the Gulf, uh, and that's uh, an area where Erdogan is going to continue to focus. And with that, I keep him, you know, I, I'm focusing on uh, what the Emirates will do, for example, with this 10 billion fund they set aside to invest in Turkey, uh, what Saudi Arabia will do since they bet uh, massively on an Erdogan win by parking $5 billion in the central bank uh, at a critical time. And what Russia will do in terms of flexibility, in terms of Turkey's outstanding energy payments, in terms of discounts for Turkish energy purposes, uh, purchases, and uh, in terms of ongoing trade and tourism relations, uh, and, and various infrastructure projects that Turkey and Russia may yet jointly undertake. Um, so I don't anticipate a shift. Uh, I think Erdogan will stick with these policies. Uh, summer months are typically quite good for Turkey, strong tourism. Uh, it, Turkey had a record year last year, uh, more of the same as anticipated this year. Uh, uh, you know, currency weakness after elections is highly likely, which is what the market is expecting. Uh, where it lands, I don't know. Uh, but uh, once there is even weaker, it will make Turkish exporters a lot more competitive. It'll make tourism in Turkey that much cheaper and attract a whole horde of 
tourists, uh, particularly from Western Europe, uh, who have not yet booked anything. Uh, and, uh, you know, with energy bills, et cetera, low over the summer, uh, we'll, we'll likely have three good months ahead of us. Uh, heading into fall, the question uh, will rise again because we're going to have to import more natural gas, burn more oil, uh, schools will start, the weather will get cold, and the bills will start rising. At that point, I think uh, U-turn will become increasingly more likely for Erdogan uh, because the current uh, economic dynamics won't be able to sustain Turkey's uh, uh, uh, uh, Turkey's needs, and Turkey will need more uh, foreign inflows to manage its external payments. And uh, given uh, deeply negative interest rates at the moment, uh, that's hard to sustain. Um, the uh, you asked about Turkey's relations with the EU. I think what we can expect is more of the same. Um, I, I, you know, on the one hand, as you point out, uh, it's uh, it's good for European policymakers because they don't have to think about how to engage with Turkey uh, because they'll be dealing with the guy they've been dealing with for two decades. Uh, and they've seen Erdogan transition from uh, the first two terms of the AKP with a strong uh, EU perspective to someone who likes to bash the EU and deal with it transactionally, uh, being preoccupied with the Ukraine war, uh, with an economic transition around uh, the European Green Deal and uh, its digital transition, uh, with trade issues, uh, the EU will be more than happy to just manage and cruise uh, on autopilot in its Turkey relations. Uh, what does that mean? Probably an update to the 1995 customs union is highly unlikely. Visa liberalization for Turks are highly unlikely. Erdogan will meet with European leaders uh, once or twice a year on the sidelines of this European political community. Uh, summits. Uh, the next one will be June 1st in Moldova. Uh, so that'll be probably Erdogan's first victory lap after the elections, uh, where he'll get to display to the world that he remains a relevant actor who's uh, geopolitical actor who's elected with 50 some percent of the vote. Uh, and at home, he can project strong leader image by, uh, you know, meeting with various European leaders, probably meeting with Zelensky uh, and, and others. Um, and and he will continue to have this uh, important but uncomfortable role from a Western perspective of being a necessary uh, but difficult partner. Uh, and we have a lot of issues tied up in Ankara at the moment. One of them is Sweden's accession to NATO uh, with the Vilnius summit fast approaching in mid-July. Uh, the other one, which is a bit more secondary now, but could, you know, rise to the top of the agenda anytime is the issue of migration and refugees, uh, given also, uh, again, as per Elchin's point, uh, the rising anti-refugee sentiment in Turkey, uh, that's increasingly a wild card in Turkey-EU relations as well. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think uh, we have the issue of sanctions, where after the elections, I think pressure from Brussels, but also Washington, which I'm sure you'll talk about, or Humeira will, uh, will rise because uh, whereas Western partners were reluctant to, seen, uh, to be seen as interfering in Turkish elections by imposing sanctions on Turkish companies or uh, sectors uh, after the elections with Erdogan having secured another five years, I think uh, uh, officials from Brussels, European capitals, the UK and Washington will come to Ankara and say, hey, look, like these are the problem areas with Russian uh, sanctions, evasion and circumvention. Either you fix it or there will be consequences. Uh, and I think Ankara will be a lot more receptive to that after the elections as well. So let me stop there. Um, to. Thank you, Emre. Uh, really great points. Uh, I, I think so much analysis recently has focused on what Erdogan has done right, what he has done wrong, uh, what he has done right, of course, uh, you know, his uh, grip over information flow and institutions and other dynamics. But uh, both Elchin and you have touched on what uh, Kılıçdaroğlu has not done well, opposition candidate for presidency. Uh, Elchin's point that, you know, he basically didn't present his uh, uh, team 
as the one that will run Turkey better than does Erdogan's. And your point about, uh, you know, his yes, he did well. Uh, it wasn't a, it wasn't bad, but he couldn't expand the base uh, beyond uh, what was already signed on to this block. So that's probably, uh, you know, another area where he did uh, underperform the expectations. And another imp imp interesting takeaway, I think. Um, Looking at economic outlook, probably summer months are not going to be as uh, painful. You know, uh, large inflows because of weakened lira, uh, uh, rising exports, but also Turkey was uh, last year the fifth most visited country in the world, and basically competing at this moment with uh, Italy, France, and Spain. So, uh, given that this will be a week of weak, weak lira, I guess tourism revenues will increase dramatically. So. It's really, I think, more six months where economic outlooks gets uh, iffy. And uh, once we get to q and I actually have one question for you guys already. It's about looking at the local elections in 2024, nationally held, sort of acting as a referendum. What kind of an impact that will help on a potential Erdogan presidency? But uh, consensus is building in the room. Uh, so far, two panelists have said they believe Erdogan is uh, leading. So I want to turn to Himera next. And uh, Himera, I want to ask you what your take is, uh, if you agree with the consensus or not. But also, I think Emre raised this point on NATO uh, expansion for Sweden. Uh, Turkey and Hungary are the two countries that still have the green light list. Maybe Emre intentionally left that for you. Uh, if you can tell us a little bit of what your take is on this, you covered these issues day to day. And also kind of broader sense of uh, how the outcome impacts U.S.-Turkish ties from F-16s to F-35s and various other issues that you deal with intimately. Sure, Sonar. Um, thanks very much for having me on this. It's uh, delightful to be here. Um, I think I have the privilege of being a journalist and not an analyst, so I can stay away from predictions. And I think um, if I had to bet my money, I probably would bet on not betting my money um, when it comes to Turkey making predictions. Um, there is still a possibility that the opposition can win. It's not over until it is over, but fair to say that when you have a tight race like this, going into it above 49% with uh, Kılıçdaroğlu barely at 45, that's a very, very comfortable lead. However, all possibilities, any, anything can happen uh, like on, on Sunday. But um, I want to, before I go into U.S.-Turkey relations, I just want to touch base on one point that both Alcin and Emre made in their remarks, um, and they both said that this is really, really important. I cannot em emphasize how important this is, um, and it's the culture wars and how Erdogan's rhetoric resonates with people because I think that is there to stay and people who are watching Turkey in the years to come it is it has to be something that they always keep in mind I covered uh, about six election cycles in Turkey referendums local elections national elections and what would happen was we would watch Erdogan speak on TV and then the next day I would be somewhere like in Kayseri, Kırkkale, uh, I don't know, Konya, here and there. I know that these are like usually conservative heartlands, uh, but wherever I go, I would go into tea house and would sit down and talk to a number of people, like people come and go, offer you tea. And then it's basically... Um, they, I would hear them repeat Erdogan's words verbatim to me, like no additions, nothing else. It just, that's how much it resonates with them. But I think in this election, we have seen something beyond that. And it's, I don't think that it's resonating anymore. I think there is a post-truth element here that perhaps we can draw comparisons with what happened with the US 2020 elections with Trump. As you know, he basically lied and said uh, Biden didn't win and he won and the election was stolen. He did not even have to show any proper evidence for that. And millions of people in the US still actually believe in him. So we, we have seen, I think the post-truth debate play out really strongly in this election. Um, over the past few days, you, you've seen um, like Erdogan basically admitting that the 
uh, the election rally footage, the video that was shown that it was indeed doctored, but that the fact that it was doctored didn't really matter. And this was his way of like basically uh, highlighting his uh, rhetoric against CHP that it's in bed with the PKK. Um, I think that's going to be really important going forward, like even if he he wins that election. It's just, it's really significant in terms of future elections in Turkey and what is real, what is truth, what's not. Um, and in terms of accountability, right? Like th there is the earthquake, there are the economic problems and the earthquake has a lot to do with how government enforced or didn't enforce safety procedures when it comes to buildings and stuff like that and construction amnesty um but people thought that like this is a disaster from god and Erdogan is the one who can save us from that similar with the with uh with the economic crisis they are suffering they are feeling the pain they have 50 lira they were able to buy three five things with it now they can buy two things with it but they just don't see Erdogan as the culprit I just wanted to say that's like I think a very very strong sort of phenomena that's going to dominate Turkish politics for for a while when it comes to U.S. Turkey relations um regardless of who wins on Sunday um based on my conversations and my impression and having covered uh both Turkey but also wider U.S. foreign policy here at the State Department the accession of Sweden to NATO by Vilnius summit is a wide priority for United States. It is beyond Washington's relationship with Turkey. Um, Finland is in, so that's important, but they really want to see Sweden in by Vilnius. Um, and the absence of that, we can discuss whether that would be a failure on US part, but it is really not something that looks good when you look at it from a transatlantic unity point of view, when you look at it from a NATO, like NATO front point of view, because I watched uh, Secretary Blinken, Biden in all of these trips, uh, like since the beginning of Ukraine war, really try to emphasize the unity rhetoric. And as journalists, we kept asking about the cracks here and there, like, are you really on the same page with Germany when it comes to Russian uh, energy? And so the fact that if Sweden is not in by July, then that's, that's going to appear as like, a. I mean, it's already been there and like Turkey, as in the words of Secretary Blinken is a challenging ally. And in his confirmation hearing, he referred to Turkey as a so-called ally. So that part is known, but there is still hope here that um, Erdogan might be elected and he might still uh, get the ratification from the Turkish parliament by July. Um, I think if uh, Kılıçdaroğlu in the kind of like uh, lesser possibility that Kılıçdaroğlu is elected, they there is quite a bit of an expectation that it might be easier for Sweden's accession to be done because they assume uh, and they bet that Kılıçdaroğlu is going to want to give a, a message to the West, to the West that like, you know, we do want to come back under the fold of NATO, we do want to adopt perhaps like a more Western approach and all that. Um, in the absence of Sweden's accession, anytime soon. Um, I don't see how Congress would move on the F-16s. And if it doesn't, then here we have like our ongoing friction that was kind of like, uh, that was frozen a little bit or like paused perhaps in an active way because of Turkey's elections. It was postponed until that. Um, Congress is very also... Uh, persistent that Sweden would go in. And Menendez, as you know, has other concerns about Turkey's human rights track record, about relations with Greece, about a possible Syria incursion and just overall Syria policy. But for now, it is the impression that if the NATO enlargement can be completed, the administration would then have more ammunition with Congress to really push for the sale of the F-16. I think there are a couple of other things going forward in U.S.-Turkey relations that U.S. is go really going to be uh, watching out for is 
you, we all have seen Erdogan's interview with CNN, where he said that he's got a special relationship with Putin. So how is the relationship going to be with Russia going forward? You know, it's, they've been trying to basically play both sides for, for some time. And that's been uh, received with an incredible amount of suspicion here in Washington. Is that going to continue? We have seen Biden administration officials pay regular visits to Turkey since the beginning of Ukraine war to warn both Ankara, but also Turkish private companies about being very careful so that they wouldn't be subject to secondary sanctions. Uh, what is what is going to be the, the main message from Ankara? We do know that there are a lot of Turkish companies who obviously, of course, care a lot about not being kicked out of the dollar system, the US system, uh, wanting to continue to have access to US system. So, but how is that all going to continue um, if you perhaps have like a, a tone and maybe more pro-Russia tone from uh, from Ankara? That's, that's gonna be also important. And I just wanna close with something broad. Um, the relationship has been transactional for quite some time and it's been uncomfortable, I think. Uh, Biden has given the cold shoulder to Erdogan. We see that in lack of, or like few phone calls, few meetings. There are expectations that President Erdogan would be here and would meet with Biden. I have even had, uh, I was on the trip with Secretary Blinken when he went to Turkey right after the earthquake. It is important to note that that trip was pre-planned and ended up uh, sort of, that date was, uh, that it ended up being just after the earthquake. It wasn't like the earthquake happened and that's why he went. But I've had people in Turkey ask me whether there was any chance that Biden would also visit. I found that really striking because there was absolutely no thinking around here that such a, such a trip would, uh, would basically take place. So what I'm trying to get at is, I think safe to bet that if we see Erdogan re-elected, it's going to be a little bit more of the same, transactional, bit uncomfortable. Um, however, I would be curious to see what the White House is going to do to put some more pressure on Erdogan on the NATO accession. Is it going to be through a carrot, a phone call, perhaps uh, an invitation? Or is it going to be in the form of a stick, um, which really doesn't work that well when it, with, with Ankara? So I'd be curious to to see that. I'll leave it there. Uh, all great points, Samira. Thank you. Uh, definitely have your ears close to the ground. Uh, I, I agree with uh, so much of what you said, especially your points on non quid pro quo, quid pro quo, F sixteen versus Swedish NATO accession how the administration is attaching huge importance to getting this done. It's campaign season uh, for the Democrats and Biden, President Biden, of course, wants to show this as a great success. And uh, so uh, in this regard, I think Ambassador Flake, uh, who's probably uh, one of Ankara's best friends on the Hill in the US, has done quite a bit, um, helping together with others move forward the first batch of this uh, uh, Turkey's request uh, regarding F-16s, the software update part. I think that was the administration's way of signaling to Turkey, look, uh, if we have continuity and momentum after the election, you know, um, we have taken the first step, uh, authorize this update, sell. If you take the next step, we'll come back to you. So uh, I guess the question then is, of course, uh, how does the administration respond? And I talked to some people in Ankara just yesterday and the day before, it looks to me that Erdogan will ask for a visit, uh, not just meeting at NATO summit, but a visit. It has to be squeezed into the summer months, has to take place, of course, before uh, the campaign season here in the US starts, in which time there's gonna be very little time for these visits. Um, so that'd be interesting to follow. I know that there are a number of people and friends in the room and colleagues, so I already have questions coming. If you're in the uh, virtual room, you can type questions into the chat box. I'll moderate the Q&A. And if you're listening to us on YouTube, a colleague just said we have thousands of uh, viewers. You can email us your questions at uh, 
policy forum at washingtoninstitute.org. What I'll do next uh, before I uh, turn to the question and answer part uh, is uh, kind of take my hat off as the moderator and, and do a, my own very brief take. I will agree, I think, with the consensus in the room, though, Limera as a journalist um, was smarter enough not to bet her money, to betting on, on her money on something. I will basically, I think, agree with uh, Elchin and Emre that President Erdogan is the favored um, uh, candidate going into the race. I think so much attention has been paid to what Erdogan has done right, that uh, lost under this was was Kılıçdaroğlu did not do so well. And I would say that um, while Turkey's electorate uh, kind of, uh, you know, gay President Erdogan, the equivalent, I'm going to use a soccer analogy here, I'll explain it for US audiences. While the electorate gay President Erdogan, the equivalent of a green, a yellow card, that's when, you know, you have a minor infraction in soccer and the referee warns you. The electorate did not flash a red card. That's when you get kicked out of the game. Uh, but then the electorate also did not give a green light, uh, you continuing with colors to Kalishtaroldo. So it looks to me that the electorate is basically saying, um, you know, problems with Erdogan, yes, but I think we'll continue with uh, Erdogan because, uh, in my view, the Kalishtaroldo campaign was uh, non polarizing, which is a great for Turkey's politics, but perhaps also equally uninspiring in the sense that it could not basically make the electorate say, I can imagine a country that's run better by Kılıçdaroğlu, I'm going to vote for it. And you can explain this through various mechanisms. I think Himeira's point, I'll agree with her on post-truth narrative is one, the electorate basically got stuck uh, at the point uh, of, of the opposition uh, block being backed by terrorists in quotes, complete lie, of course, and never move to the point of what can they do for uh, Turkey. But I want to move actually and present uh, kind of three outcomes using um, some of these conclusions by my colleagues that how Turkey looks after the elections moving forward. So assuming it's a win by President Erdogan, I think that uh, there are areas uh, where we should analyze or focus. One is economy. President Erdogan's an embrace of unorthodox economic policy, so keeping interest rates low because he believes interest rates drive inflation. The second is foreign policy, leaning uh, towards Russia, onto Putin rather. And the third, of course, is uh, democracy and rights, kind of cracking down on the opposition and demonizing the opposition. Change and continuity in these three areas. I think it depends on not if Erdogan wins at this stage, perhaps what, what kind of a margin he wins by. I'll start with uh, the least plausible scenario and move on to the most likely and present uh, outcomes for these three areas. Um, a very narrow win by President Erdogan, uh, less than 1% margin. Uh, would be contested by the opposition. Erdogan would immediately, in my view, shut down that contestation, controls the media, police, electoral bodies, and courts. But the opposition would basically continue to say that the election was stolen and rigged uh, because its contestation never received a thorough review. Uh, that would, I think, leave President Erdogan feeling quite vulnerable. Also because notwithstanding his complete control of institutions and almost uh, information flow and 90% of the media, he just he got only 50.5%. He's going to feel quite vulnerable and fragile. Uh, so I think that suggests, unfortunately, uh, more crackdowns and opposition going forward, lest the opposition surface in a tsunami and votes him out in local elections or votes his mayors out in local elections. Probably leaning more onto Putin because that means more financial inflows uh, from Russia, um, tourism and, and others, and just Putin's obviously very generous gifts and discounts and um, uh, uh, you know, uh, acceptance of delayed payments. And then I would say on economy, uh, it would be uh, Erdogan saying, uh, I have little room to make any changes now, continue with the same model of doubling down on orthodoxy. Moving on to the next model by, you know, plausibility, I would say Erdogan landslide, 55% uh, um, uh, or something near that. Likely if uh, a lot of liberals and leftists who voted for Kılıçdaroğlu are disgruntled, I'm going to ask Elchin about that, about uh, the mood on the field among educated Turks and uh, about their role in Turkey's future. But if the mood among the electorate is, uh, if you can't vote Erdogan out in the first round when election inflation is 50%, when? If that depresses turnout, it could result in an Erdogan landslide because most of his uh, first round voters did not show up. I think that would give us emboldened Erdogan in foreign policy. He would say, I was right on all my instincts on orthodox policy, on Russia. And uh, while at home, he doesn't have to worry about a vigorous opposition, uh, given that uh, there is a right bloc majority in the parliament and that uh, there are also many right-wing deputies in the opposition bloc, 
when you add them up, you get nearly 400 deputies out of 600. That's the biggest right-wing majority in Turkey in the last 20 years. And given that there are far-right deputies in this coalition, some of which have archaic social views, that they want to criminalize adultery, segregate public education, uh, I could see President Erdogan kind of legislating along some of these lines because he feels emboldened and vindicated. But I want to end with the last scenario, which is where I think Ebra and I come together. Uh, the, the most plausible in my view, you know, Erdogan wins comfortably, but not by a landslide. I think it ends up with a continuity of policy. You know, the model works, don't need to tweak it. Uh, transactionalist between US and Russia, um, unorthodox, uh, why not? It works, uh, obviously, tourism money and uh, summer dynamics will also help. And in terms of rights and freedoms, perhaps continuity of policy. So my takeaway is uh, if the outcome is indeed where Erdogan wins comfortably, that's 52, 48, 53, 47. Uh, it could probably result in um, an, a continuity of most of the policies we have seen. I want to end here uh, and I want to uh, turn to questions now because I want to ask my colleagues a bunch of questions being waiting in the room. One is, I guess, kind of broadly speaking, uh, to get the opposition out of the way before we turn to kind of a potential Turkey going forward, um, opposition strategies, that is. Elections are coming up for local government in spring 2024. And this is for all three of you, whoever wants to jump in first. Um, you know, you know, opposition has learned that it can defeat Erdogan only if it's united. That strategy worked in 2019 local elections. Whether or not it works this time, especially if it doesn't work, you know, how do you see the opposition going forward? Does it splinter? Does it fall along right, left lines? Does President Erdogan poach some right-wing deputies and groups from the opposition bloc so that gives, gives them a bigger uh, majority? And alternatively, you could take both sides of the question. What does that mean for President Erdogan's strategy if he does not want comfortably or with a landslide? Because although local elections don't change government, uh, they are nationally held and they act sort of as a referendum on Erdogan's power and controlling local governments in Turkey is not a small thing, uh, especially Istanbul, you control a lot of rent and money. So uh, how, in your view, local elections will impact um, opposition strategies, uh, staying together and Erdogan's strategies uh, going forward? Um, whoever would like to jump in first. Um, <clears throat> I think it depends, Sonar, uh, at what percentage Erdogan wins. If you, like you say, if it's a win, you know, landslide, yes, he will, uh, he will try everything in his power to get the local elections as well. And don't forget, there is um, already a um, case, law, uh, you know, court case about Imamoğlu. Right. And some of the AKP uh, politicians were on Twitter, were um, threatening him. You shall see after the elections kind of uh, rhetoric. So if the opposition uh, mayors like HDP are, uh, you know, intimidated legally, uh, that might very well affect the uh, uh, local elections. But before local elections, there might be, I mean, if Erdogan wins, like you say, half a percent, uh, you know, with a, with a tiny margin, if the elections are contested, I would very much easily see, uh, you know, a repetition of elections. And, you know, again, an early elections, because not only Erdogan would like to consolidate his power again, you know, obviously he will try to avoid this, uh, you know, as much as he can. But, you know, if there is a big um, grassroots movements against them, you know, if people really believe, uh, which by the way, opposition supporters believe that the, these elections, even the 14th of May elections were stolen, there might be some unrest happening in the country. So the the ideal scenario would be like you say, you know, not a landslide and not a very small margin, which we can never know, you know, except um, on the night of the uh, elections. And you you said about the opposition base, how they feel about it, you know, will they go to vote again? Uh, although most of them are very frustrated and some of them are very angry, some of them really blame the opposition uh, parties and politicians that they couldn't deliver in these elections, 
uh, they don't see it as a question of what candidate. It's not about Kılıçdaroğlu and İmamoğlu or any other candidate. It's about the referendum of the continuation of a regime. Are we going to go back to old uh, Turkish system, which is more democratic, checks and balances, some kind of institutions, you know, holding on the state apparatus? Or are we going to vote for one man and become a party state? Because when I was talking to this very young women uh, students at the Fatih Mosque, they were praying, you know, afterwards we had a chat and I said, you know, what do you think of the state? You know, the continuation of the state because that was the main um, uh, argument of the AKP camp. The state has to continue the stability, the survivability of the state. And, and you know what one of the girls told me, and I was quite surprised. She said, but this is a very young state. We have only been in power 20 years. So in her mind, state equals to party. So it depends on one of your scenarios, which would really uh, strengthen this. So if Erdogan comes with a landslide, we will uh, be stuck, Turkish people will be stuck with a party state for a very long time. And I'm afraid that might turn into a Chinese model or Putin model, whatever you, you, you, you might wanna you know, describe it with. But uh, there will be very sharp polarization, even sharper. There will be a huge brain drain, which has been going on for the you know, last five years. Because after the coup, like uh, coup attempt, there is you know no checks and balances. This is one uh, one man uh, state basically. Economy in deep recession. Yeah, maybe he will go on with the unorthodox policies. Maybe he won't. Maybe he will get money from those guys, and maybe he will get money from other guys. But definitely, two things are certain: decrease in fundamental freedoms. That's for certain. And the disadvantaged group, like women's uh, women and you know children and the LGBTQs are going to be um, widely uh, widely threatened and hunted down, unfortunately. I don't know uh, about the local elections. I am, you know, I'm also a journalist. I'm only thinking in uh, two weeks time periods, <laughs> but uh, there is lots, uh, there's lots to change. I mean, there is uh, lots to um, evaluate after that. Thank you. Emre, uh, do you want to go next? And then I'll come to Mira. Um, I mean, I think, the, the opposition question is very difficult, Sona, and I think that will depend also on what happens on the national stage and how the parliamentary dynamics play off. Um, we've essentially seen that the CHP gained practically nothing by aligning with former AKP uh, politicians, uh, Davutoglu's future party and Babajan's Deva. Uh, it also gained, I mean, effectively nothing by aligning with the Islamist Felicity Party uh, and the Democrat Party, right? So uh, the E Party saw that by uh, backing uh, more moderate candidates, uh, by stepping away from nationalist voters, it couldn't build and indeed marginally lost some votes uh, to its main rival on the right, MHP. Um, so, and Erdogan will want to hedge his position by trying to reduce his dependency on the MHP, on the new welfare party, etc. So the opposition bloc holding even in parliament is an open question. Uh, and I think uh, the more Erdogan consolidates power and the more he can bring them into the fold, especially with polarizing issues such as cross-border operations, et cetera, et cetera, um, the harder it is for the opposition to maintain its motivation and unity for a uh, joint bloc, again, heading into uh, the, uh, the local elections in March 2024. Um, and I'd also like to you know, expand on Alcin's point. I mean, I think the threat against Imamolo are real, uh, if his you know, judiciary process is concluded and he's removed from office come October, I will not be surprised. Uh, and, you know, 
that that will give Erdogan enough time to like build on his like post-election uh, victory and also give him enough time to make people forget that he's jailed the Istanbul's popular mayor before the March elections uh, or banned him from politics. So, um, so I think it's an increasingly difficult fight for the opposition, local elections and onward. Great points. I agree. I think President Erdogan's game will be to take Istanbul, Ankara, other cities from the opposition and opposition fracturing, of course, helps. Uh, Himera, did you want to come in quickly? And then I have a round of individual questions from the audience for each of you guys uh, for quick uh, uh, answers coming up. Yeah, sure. Um, pretty much in line with what Elton and uh, Emre is saying, uh, but I, I, I want to make a couple of uh, little other points. So uh, I really... On May the 15th, I started questioning how this alliance is going to actually survive the next two weeks because of what both of them just said. Uh, CHP really didn't gain anything by, by being in this alliance. If you look at the parliamentary seats, it's very clear. So I think if Erdogan wins on Sunday, to be honest, like, uh, if he wins with like a clear margin, there's going to be an incredible amount of soul searching on the side of uh, opposition. And I think that's going to be the case for uh, the, for E party specifically, but also also CHP uh, in 2019, when they won all of the big cities, uh, they did try the alliance model. And on, on that, uh, it actually worked. Would they be able to strike some sort of an alliance going into spring 2024. It's a little bit unclear. Um, I think important to note that there is a big nationalist mandate that came out from, from this, uh, this election, far right, but also nationalist. How do you account for that in however you do your opposition and however you uh, form your alliance? Um, we're we're basically looking at MHP votes, E party votes, and Sinan Oan votes, and there is this incredible nationalistic tone. And sure, local elections might be about like services and this and that. But again, like you said, in Turkey, every election is about Erdogan, and it's a referendum on whether we want to continue with this system or we want to change it. So how does how does the opposition take into account that nationalist? wave and try to make a make turn it into an advantage um i don't see a particular path for now and one thing i also want to touch base on is um i don't think chp in particular but overall opposition uh performed well when it comes to their efforts and organization and election security journalists asked again and again and again are you prepared Prepared? Are you prepared for like to man the ballot boxes? Do you have your system? Be that like their technological system, the system that they put, the, they, they count the votes. Because I mean, I think those tallies from the ballot boxes, they are the insurance of any election. And that was that played a very, very key role in the Istanbul election. Let's not forget that Imamoglu was only 13,000 votes ahead in the Istanbul election, and his rival Bin Ali Yildirim was declaring that he was winning. But the reason that he was able to push back was because they had those tallies and because they had manned every single ballot box. Are we able to say that CHP replicated that performance in this national election, despite their assurances, they didn't. So whatever form, whatever rhetoric, whatever strategy they are going to be uh, formulating for the local elections, the election security element of that and manning the ballot boxes, that has to be a big part of that. I agree with that. And I wanted to add that, you know, while uh, I described uh, Kulisharlo's campaign not, not as uh, inspiring as people uh, expect it to be, I think it's still quite impressive, uh, notwithstanding shortages of regarding election security. You know, this is the most uh, percentage of votes a leftist candidate in Turkey ever got. Not everyone who voted for Kulisharlo was leftist, but even in the, uh, the height of European socialism, working class movements, charismatic leader, a leftist candidate in Turkey at most got 41% under Ecevit in 1970, so quite impressive, but still not enough. Emre, I have a quick question for you. We have only a few minutes left, so maybe 60-second answers uh, about uh, Russian and Gulf money. 
uh, in your view, did this make a difference? And will it continue to make a difference for uh, Erdogan's political survival, especially in the summer months, but also in the run up to local elections? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, if it weren't for the 10 to 15 billion US dollars that uh, funneled into Turkey from uh, Russia between mid-August to through September of last year, uh, Turkey would have been faced with a uh, significant economic crisis heading into October. Uh, so Russia came to save the day. Uh, and then subsequently, as I mentioned, uh, Saudi Arabia agreed to part $5 billion dollars God knows with what strings attached to the central bank uh, in Turkey. Uh, and the UAE uh, put aside this 10 billion fund that I mentioned to invest in assets in Turkey. Uh, so going forward, I would anticipate and I suspect Adnan is counting on continued inflows from Russia and the Gulf to sustain his economic model. Thank you. Uh, and I have a question for Elchin also, but I don't want to put you guys on the spot since Deborah mentioned uh, Russia, Saudi support. I was going to ask you at, before we conclude to give me your uh, list of top three, top five countries whose phone calls to congratulate and President Erdogan is likely going to prioritize. I'm going to do my own list. I was thinking, is it going to be the U.S.? Is it going to be Putin? Uh, Elchin, um, a question for you on uh, brain drain uh, of educated Turks and youth after the elections. Will they stay in to do one more democratic fight if Erdogan wins in the local elections? Or what was your sense of talking to people on the ground of how they see their place and the uh, future of their kids' uh, place in Turkey's future. Sure. I really, really try to speak to young people, especially the first-time voters. Um, and I saw this immense desire, even with the supporters of, let's say, kids coming from AKP families, you know, not necessarily AKP supporters. They want to leave the country. And I think according to one of the research um, results, 74 or 76% of the young people in Turkey want to live and uh, live abroad, you know, study or work. And which is a huge number, you know, this is like, uh, you know, huge brain drain and which is, you know, threatening the future of the country. You know, doctors are leaving, engineers are leaving. Uh, white collar workers, you know, who were very well educated by the Turkish uh, education system are leaving. So that leaves a lot of, um, you know, problems to uh, deal with. But when I was there, I saw some of the, uh, some, some campaigns that Sam Boazici, you know, one of the Ivy League uh, universities in Turkey, students want to come back if Kılıçdaroğlu wins. So they were organizing this you know, wave, I'd like to come back and work more for my country, uh, kind of little video clips. And, um, and the other interesting thing I saw on, on the ground is, you know, when I was talking to kids from AKP families, uh, they wouldn't vote for Erdogan, and they would say, I wouldn't vote for Kılıçdaroğlu either. And when I ask why, they would say they are way too old for us, they are over 40. But then, strangely, they would say, I would go vote for Inge. And after Inge disappeared, I think they just voted for Sinan Oan, you know, from the scene. So it is a very interesting dynamic going on now. Uh, and I realized when I talked to AKP people, they weren't very happy with the result themselves either. Because after all this uh, money they, they just, you know, threw at them, you know, the wage hikes, you know, the pensioners, in, you know, increase and all the propaganda, you know, they were quite advan advantaged. They still didn't think 49.5% was enough. Right. And, um, and unfortunately, opposition base has already wanted to leave. They were trying to leave. But I don't know how they are going to manage now uh, since, you know, the, the countries do not give, you know, foreign countries do not give visas or work permits or, you know, the family re reunion. So it is a very tough spot. I mean, they might feel a bit imprisoned. They might feel hostage in, inside the country and where all these people who left might feel hostage outside of the country. And as Emre says, this is all um, down to identity politics. It's a very strong feeling us uh, versus again, you know, against them. Yeah, uh, already I, very strong trends of brain drain. I mean, it's uh, like uh, 
what uh, it takes Turkey fifteen thousand dollars to train a doctor, and ten thousand doctors have moved to Germany already. Uh, I want to just really uh, quickly wrap up because we have only a little bit of time left. Uh, uh, and thank you again, Alchin. I appreciate your comments from the field and uh, from the ground. Uh, so, Himera, a question about um, U.S.-Turkish ties uh, would be a game changer if President Biden extended an invitation to Erdogan. Uh, you know, you you work closely with U.S. government. Is this likely? Is this plausible? Uh, so, one of the reason I'm asking this question is the background. Someone emailed it to me. You know, when Biden won in 2020, at the time, of course, Erdogan was a uh, lame duck. He had lost local government elections. It looked like he was not any more popular and perhaps a president on his way out. If Erdogan makes a comeback, does this change the Biden White House's perception of continuity, you know, Turkish ties, uh, ties and Erdogan's ability to survive? Um, Sonar, I think when Biden administration first took over, they wanted to make a very clear point that things were going to be different compared to the Trump era, during which it was what some Turkish officials would like to describe as leaders diplomacy, which is effectively bypassing the institutions and just letting these two leaders uh, talk it out. Whatever institute, whatever problems that they have, that that was an approach that bypassed some of bypassed the State Department, bypassed like uh, the Turkish Foreign Ministry. Um, I think when the administration came, we have seen like a number of critical statements from the State Department. They made a statement about Bozici. They talked about Osman Kavala. These were like non-existent in the during the Trump White House, which overall had very little regard for championing human rights anyways. Um, I would expect Biden, I mean, if Ar if President Erdogan wins, that's basically it. That's uh, President Biden's counterpart. And he was asked about Turkey election, uh, I believe a week ago on the, just on the day. And he said, I hope whoever wins, wins. And State Department multiple times said, we're looking forward to working whoever wins. What else can they say? Like, of course, you're not going to hear anything else publicly uh, from the State Department. They've, I've ha I have not seen them uh, sort of favor any candidate in any election uh, in the world. As I, as I said, like, would they suddenly have a different relationship? It's a little bit hard to say that. Why would there be? Because in terms of Erdogan, um, why would he change anything uh, like in his course? If he gets 51, 52, whatever, as you said, like a comfortable margin, that is going to be a stamp of approval for everything that he has done so far. So why would he change course? If he doesn't change course, would the US change course and try to uh, try a completely different approach of like trying to get Turkey into the fold? like? An invitation might be on the cards because there hasn't been one since the beginning of this administration. And again, like you said, if it were done, if it were extended before, it might have come across as like, this is our preferred candidate to the elect Turkish electorate. They obviously didn't want to do that. So an, an invitation might be in the cards. And don't forget, US is going into, like you said, election period. There is going to be an incredible amount of emphasis on keeping solidarity, keeping unity on Ukraine. And at some point, there is going to be some, some scenarios, some thinking about how the Ukraine war, I don't wanna say can come to an end because I don't want to indicate that it's going to be up, up to the Western countries, ex, like imposing something on Ukraine, but everyone agrees that this cannot go on forever. So if you are going to start thinking about how some sort of a negotiation, some sort of diplomacy with Russia, including Ukraine, will look like, are you going to also consider perhaps Turkey might play a part, even though despite how it's being described, like challenging ally, would Erdogan be willing to do that. There is obviously the grain deal corridor as an example, how Turkey was instrumental. So all of those, I think we'll, we will have to watch how, how all of those go. 
I agree. And I think if Turkey has greenlit Sweden's NATO accession, of course, could be quite a game changer, at least in the short term. We are unfortunately uh, out of our time, but I did ask you guys to prepare mental lists. So I'll just go around quickly. Of, uh, most leaders, most country leaders will line up on the, after the 18th, uh, 28th, sorry, to call President Erdogan if he wins, to congratulate. Assuming he won, what is your list of top three, top five countries? Erdogan's palace is going to prioritize these calls and tell some of them, you know, I will call you back and tell some of them I'll patch you through the president. So we can maybe finish with this fun fact of, you know, leaders whose uh, phone calls Erdogan is most likely to take. Uh, maybe we'll start with Emre and then and go around to Himera and then end up with Elchin. With the caveat that if Biden calls, he takes top spot, I would say... Uh, Asin Tatar of the Northern Republic, uh, sorry, of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, uh, Aliyev of Azerbaijan, and Putin in Russia. All right, Mera. Uh, definitely Biden. I mean, Erdogan wins. That's his counterpart. A phone call would be natural and diplomatic. Uh, Definitely Putin, Azerbaijan. I have a feeling perhaps Erdogan might call back Macron later. That's great. And Elchin? Uh, well, it's not very far from uh, my friends. Aliyev definitely, probably the first. Maybe he will even come on the balcony speech. Yeah. And uh, Putin, definitely. Maybe Orban as well. <laughs> <laughs> I will agree with you guys. I think definitely Aliyev, uh, Tatar, maybe Altani, Qatar also, uh, but uh, Putin uh, as well as uh, high up there. Uh, with that, I want to thank my uh, colleagues uh, for joining me at today's panel, Learn the Ton. Uh, for everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this event is public. Uh, use uh, what you learned from this in your analysis, reporting on social media, tweet it. A round of applause to Emre, uh, Elchin, and Humeira. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it.